This episode is brought to you by Fooley Gemstones. Would I have wanted to spend time with her? Absolutely. Do I admire her courage? Absolutely. Did she make profoundly terrible decisions at times? Yes, absolutely. Was she a genius? Yes, absolutely. Is she a symbol, an all too rare symbol of the female gaze? Yes, yes, and yes again. I'm Carol Holton, the voice of jewellery. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm an author and broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas and forgotten histories. So join me as I tell sparkly tales and meet all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. Today we're talking about a legendary designer and businesswoman who half a century after her death is still influencing the way we dress now. She invented the little black dress, trousers for women, advised to wear yards of pearls, the bob haircut, the best-selling perfume, and was the founder of one of the most successful fashion brands of all time. Yes, it's the fashion and jewellery revolutionary Coco Chanel. And I'm delighted to welcome the best-selling author, and woman who knows her best. Well, she would do. She spent 25 years researching Chanel's life in a bid to unravel the myths and mysteries, and along the way has discovered new material to be published this month in a new biography, Coco Chanel, The Legend and the Life, to coincide with a new blockbuster exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum titled Gabriel Chanel Fashion Manifesto. Welcome, Justine Picardy. How lovely to be here with you. (laughs) Thank you for coming. Um, Many of you know Justine um, is a journalist and for many years was on the opposite side of the glossy fence to me. She was the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar whilst I was at Vogue. We coincided at quite a lot of Chanel events in our time. And one of them was at um, Coco Chanel's house, La Pausa, when Chanel had just bought it back. And they had the launch of a new jewellery collection called Flying Cloud, named after the Duke of Westminster's yacht, The Flying Cloud. And she used to vacation in this house that she built in the 1930s. And we met at an event there, didn't we, Justine? That's right. And what did you feel going back to one of the places Places she was so closely associated with. Well, it was wonderful. As a writer, I always want to go to the places where the person I'm writing about has lived and spent time. And La Pausa is such an important place in the story of Coco Chanel. As you say, you know, she built it for herself as a summer house. It was built in 1929. And you mentioned the flying cloud, the Duke of Westminster's mm. yacht. He was a man with not one, but two private yachts, one of which was the biggest private yacht in the world. And 1929, when Chanel builds La Pausa, she's still involved in a relationship with the Duke of Westminster. They'd met at the end of 1923 and embarked on a love affair Um, a few months later in the spring of 1924. And La Pausa was going to be a home for both of them. In fact, it turned out not to be because the Duke uh, in 1930 married his third wife, an aristocratic young Englishwoman called Lelia Ponsonby. Needless to say, as was so often the case, both in his life and in Chanel's life, the affair continued with Chanel for a time and they also remained very good friends. But La Pausa is so significant because it provides so many clues in the mysteries about Chanel. The first of which is that when the house was built in 1929 and Chanel bought the plot of land that it stands on the year before in 1928, and it takes its name, La Pausa, um, from the legend that Mary, Jesus's mother, had stopped. She had paused at La Pausa on her flight from Jerusalem. And there's a chapel there. So it's a very meaningful place for Chanel. But it also contains within it this profound and important secret about her childhood, which is that she asked 
the architect, who was a young Frenchman called Robert Streis, to go to Oberzine, the convent where she had been educated, brought up by nuns after her mother had died and after her father had abandoned her. Now, when she was abandoned at Oberzine, she never talked about it in her later life to anybody. She'd been born illegitimate. It was a source of great shame and humiliation to her. So she never talked about Oberzine. And yet this convent clearly had a profound influence on her because she asks Robert Streis to go to Oberzine to sketch and draw and measure the central staircase in the abbey because it's a medieval abbey there and to replicate it at La Pausa. There too at La Pausa as you will have seen when we met there are cloisters around an inner courtyard. They too are a replica of the ones that she remembered from her childhood. So it's an incredibly important place that in some senses, takes you into the heart of Gabrielle Chanel's most private self. There's so many um, unsatisfactory moments, like you just alluded to the fact that the Duke of Westminster didn't marry her because she couldn't have a child and he had to have this aristocratic wife to bear him a son. So many unsatisfactory moments that actually turned out to be the big inspiration for her. So can you tell us a bit about the convent, how not just at La Pausa, how she took inspiration for that th through her career? Yes, yeah, so Chanel was born in 1883, and it's so important, I think, to remember she was born in the 19th century, despite becoming the epitome of the idea of a modern woman, and born into profound poverty. And her father was a travelling market trader who used to sell needles and thread and buttons and lace, which I think I found so touching when you think mm -hmm. that this is literally what she's born into, the tools of what will become her trade. And her father was a man who was basically always on the run from his responsibilities and the mother of his children. Gabrielle was the second daughter. There were five children and their mother died in abject poverty and abandoned state of abandonment in February 1895 when Chanel was 11. Their father wasn't there. So these little children were with their dying mother. And then somebody found the father. He came to collect them. He abandoned his two sons, two little boys, basically to work as unpaid child labour in local farms. And the three girls, including the 11-year-old Gabrielle, he abandoned at an orphanage that was run by nuns at Oberzine, which was a nearby medieval abbey. I mean, it's a very austere place, but it's a very influential place in her aesthetic development. So I went there. I was the first writer to follow in her footsteps to go there. And I went there in winter and the nuns the, from the same order of nuns were still, there were still some nuns there, only a handful. Mm -hmm. And obviously there wasn't an orphanage there anymore that had closed. I arrived and it was freezing cold and I'd written, it's an almost silent order of nuns, and I'd written to the mother superior to say, could I come? And she said that I could come, but I had to follow their routine. So I slept in a little iron bed, in a little sort of nun's cell. There was no heating, there was no hot water. It was freezing cold. So you were having the complete experience. Absolutely, the complete experience. Did you go to morning prayers? I did. <laughs> I went to prayers morning, noon and night and, you know, dawn till dusk. Eventually, I recognised what at first seemed seemed like a very bleak and austere and forbidding place, had a sort of beauty in it which influenced Chanel. And what really struck me were there are stained glass windows, but they're monochrome and they're abstract. And they were put there by the Cistercian monks, the medieval monks. And they are a kind of black and white and a pearl grey. And they look like, and I reproduce it in my book, the stained glass window, the double C of the Chanel logo. I mean, she wasn't even known as Coco Chanel when she was a child. She was Gabrielle, Gabrielle Chanel. And then the other thing that really struck me was the whitewashed walls, the sandstone floors. Then there's a mosaic corridor that contains thousands of tiny pebbles that had been made in the 14th century is a very intricate mosaic. And she walked along this corridor morning, noon and night 
to her prayers, just as I was doing. And there in the corridor, you see the five-sided stars, the crescent moon, what looks like a Maltese cross that then are so important and appear in her jewellery and in other symbols like little buttons. And it's all there from her childhood. And the monochrome of the nun's habits. Exactly. So the the nuns that were still there when I was there still wore those long black habits with white cuffs and a white collar. And it's so true to what Chanel then develops as her iconography and her sartorial language of style. So it's there in Aubazine from the start. Which is, A, you must think that a very austere, probably quite a tough upbringing, but also there's a comfort in it, in the ritual, in the same process, the same things that you do every day. It's probably quite comforting as well. Yes, and I suppose she turns this trauma of abandonment and loss and bereavement, it becomes a source of creative inspiration in later life. Mm. And you see this over and over again in Chanel's life, these profound moments or episodes of trauma, of heartbreak, of bereavement, of abandonment, which are in one sense repeating the pattern Mm -hmm. of her childhood. And yet over and over again, she turns it creatively into a source of inspiration. So, you know, the first great love of her life Boy Capel, an Englishman who she falls in love with and he gave her the money to set up her first business. And that was the hat business? The hat business in 1909. And then she sets up a couture salon in Rue Cambon in 1910. He breaks her heart more than once. So uh, he married an aristocratic English woman. God, she must have hated aristocratic (laughs) English women by the end of her life. But they all became her clients. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And she employed them. She employed them. They became her clients. They made her famous. But he served as a captain in the British Army during the First World War and he met a young war widow who was called Diana Windham. She was the daughter of Lord Ribblesdale and had married young and her young husband had been killed on the front in the First World War in the first month of the war. And then she met Captain Capel. She was driving an ambulance at the front line and he married her. Actually, in 1916, they met and she had her first child with him in 1917. Anyway, needless to say, his relationship with Chanel continued. She continued to be the mistress and He was then killed in a car crash driving to the south of France from Paris to Cannes in 1919 and it broke Chanel's heart again. And she started wearing black. Black, of course, was being worn by so many women at this point because so many people had lost someone in the First World War. Women had lost their sons, their husbands, their brothers, their fathers. And so black, as it had been for generations, was associated with the colour of mourning. Chanel starts wearing black in mourning for her lover, Boy, and then she transforms it into the colour of strength and independence with the little black dress that she begins to introduce in the early 1920s with the Jazz Age. And of course, the little black dress is totally associated with those women of the Jazz Age that are gaining the liberation that women are beginning to gain during the First World War when they join the workforce, when they drive ambulances, as the young Diana Wyndham did. They're going to work. They're taking on responsibility. They're wearing trousers. By this point, during the First World War, Chanel has started wearing trousers. She's cut her hair short. She's taken away corsets. And all those things are so appropriate to women during the war. And then she turns the colour of mourning into the iconic little black dress that Chanel is so associated with the little black dress. And in 1926, American Vogue pronounces the little black dress, the Chanel little black dress, to be the Chanel Ford, i.e. the car that only comes in one colour, the model Ford Model T, that only comes in the colour black, but nevertheless is associated with sort of sleek modernity and speed. And there it is. And yet again, just as you see with her experience at Aubazine, you see Chanel with a little black dress turning bereavement and sorrow into creative inspiration. Did the double C's entwine? Did that come from her Coco and Capel? Well, I like to 
think it did. <laughs> I mean, you know, that could well be magical thinking on my part. Of course, I believe in magical thinking. And Chanel was a great magical thinker. So, Carol, you would have been to her apartment yes. in Rue Combon. Yes her private apartment, which is still there above the couture salon. And there you see so much of that inner magical world, the double C's that appear in the chandeliers, the fortune-telling globes that are on the coffee table, the, the lions, books, the lions. Leo, because she was a Leo. Exactly, the astrology, the wheat, which is a symbol of prosperity, the fortune-telling cards. And Capel was a believer in something called theosophy, which was a sort of early 20th century kind of mystical philosophy which combined different forms of religion and spirituality. And you see all of this in her apartment. And I think that the double C would have been so meaningful to her because although she never marries boy, they are forever a union and linked through the double C. I'm sure as we go on to talk, we'll see so many paradoxes in her life. But I think one that really struck me was how she was this sort of feminist icon, abandoning the corsets, taking away frills and the unnecessary things that she felt women were adorning themselves with, loose cardigans, so to have freedom of movement. And yet she was subject the to patriarchy. the patriarchy. Yes, she was subject to the patriarchy. She was um, all these men who sort of controlled her heart and her life to some degree. And she allowed them time and again to humiliate her. Well, I think that paradox, paradox is you can't understand Chanel without understanding those paradoxes. Also, she's born in the 19th century. Women don't even have the right to vote when she sets up her own business. Women don't get the right to vote in France until 1945, until the end of the Second World War. They're not even allowed to own their own businesses to begin with. So Chanel has learned to be a survivor. You know, that is what her harsh and traumatic childhood has taught her. You know, her future, when she leaves the convent, was either to become a nun, and she certainly didn't want to do that, or to be a seamstress. She becomes a seamstress. The nuns have taught her how to sew. And then she goes and works in a cavalry garrison town where the French cavalry, a cavalry regiment, is based and there she starts she's sewing both at a haberdashery shop and a seamstress and also at a tailoring establishment and there she meets a young cavalry officer who's the man that gives her her first break mm -hmm. as it were and he's called Etienne Basson she has an affair with him because that is her means of escape and she leaves Moulin with him and goes to live with him after he leaves the army and he buys a chateau because he has a string of racehorses and polo ponies and at this point she's just one of a string of his mistresses so she seizes that means of escape but she also defines herself as being different to the other mistresses who were courtesans grand courtesans or women known as demi mondain you know women in that sort of not respectable women and she defines herself as being different to them and this is in the early years of the 20th century, by the clothes that she makes for herself. She's learning to ride, and she wears twill riding breeches, riding jodhpurs, white shirts, which she's adapting, men's shirts, a gentleman's riding jacket, and little softly knitted ties, and riding boots. I mean, it, if she walked into this room right now, dressed as she was in those early years of the 20th century, she'd look incredibly chic. Mm. And of course, she did look chic then, and she would look chic now, but she's doing it to show she's not like the other women, whether the respectable wives who are wearing corsets and long trailing dresses and big hats, or the courtesans, you know, who are dripping with jewellery and many of whom are actresses and are on the stage. She has to invent herself and she reinvents herself over and over again through her clothes and her jewels. And so it's a sort of androgyny that is what we do now. So exactly. she was kind of ahead of herself. And do you think she was trying to sort of grasp on a bit of that male confidence that she saw men had the power, the confidence? trying to give herself some of that. Yes, and I think that she only looks like her 
herself. She looks entirely herself in the way that she dresses and having the short hair when she cuts her hair short. And I think that she's giving both herself and to the women who then want to dress like her the sartorial dignity and ease and comfort and assurance that has previously only been the preserve of a gentleman. So by wearing gentlemen's clothes, whether it's the sporting clothes of the English gentleman in the form of Boy Capel or of the French polo player like Etienne Balson, it's gentleman's tailoring. Mm -hmm. And that dignity is crucial to her self-respect. But these gentlemen certainly didn't behave like gentlemen towards her. I mean, I guess the template of your father is a philandering Exactly. Rotter. You're going to go for the philandering rotters. And she had a string of them, didn't and she? And the thing that is so touching and, and to me is so touching about her is that she always remained loyal mm. to, to them. She remained friends with Etienne Balson until his death. Mm. One of the great mysteries is did she have a child with Etienne? In theory, there was a little boy called Andre and Etienne was Andre's godfather. Andre may have been Etienne's son, we'll never know, but the official story was that Andre was Chanel's nephew that was the the daughter of one of Chanel's two sisters, both of whom killed themselves. And after her older sister, Julia, killed herself um, in 1910 and the little boy was six, then Chanel takes him on and really brings him up almost as a as a son. So do you think it could have been her child? Well, we'll never know. When I was researching my book, I got to know. So her nephew, let's call him her nephew, Andre, Um, had a daughter called Gabrielle, Mm -hmm. who was officially Chanel's great niece, as opposed to her granddaughter. Gabrielle Palace, or Gabrielle Labruni, as her married name was, was incredibly important to me while I was researching the book. She inherited Chanel's jewellery. She knew Chanel very well. The Duke of Westminster was her godfather. She was born in 1926 when Chanel was involved in her relationship with the Duke of Westminster. And Chanel loved her. And I spent the a night with her um, at her home in the French countryside. And two very significant things happened on that particular visit. First of all, she told me that one of Chanel's oldest friends and who'd been one of her first employees, but who'd known Chanel even before she opened her first business in 1909, had told Gabrielle that Chanel may have been her grandmother rather than her great aunt. And she'd heard that from other people too, but she felt that if Gabrielle Chanel had wanted her to know that, she would have told her. And Gabrielle Chanel was very private about Mm. her past. So Gabrielle the Younger had just decided she would just accept the relationship for what it was, a loving relationship. She wasn't going to question her about whether or not her father Andre was Gabrielle Chanel's son or nephew. So that was the first significant thing. And then she'd said to me, I want to show you something. You can't understand Gabrielle Chanel without me showing you these things. I'm just going to share this with our audience now, that Carol and I had been talking about a rock crystal that was very important to you. And there was something that was very, very important to Gabrielle Chanel, which was it was part of a meteorite which had fallen to earth and Chanel had wanted to buy it but she was actually given it because she was told you cannot buy that which has fallen from the sky so it looks like a sort of piece of it's almost like sort of black diamond exactly it It looks like a black crystal hmm. and she'd left it to Gabrielle in her will so she showed me that and she said "You, you must touch it in order to feel her and understand her and then she took me down the corridor to a bedroom a guest bedroom and there was a wardrobe along the wall just a very simple wardrobe and on the wall there was a picture of the young Gabrielle which appears in my book and it's before she'd cut her hair and her hair is sort of piled up and she's in profile it's a very beautiful picture and then she said "Um, open the doors to the wardrobe and I opened the wardrobe doors and in it were a beautiful row of Chanel jackets and suits And she said, um, these were Auntie Coco's clothes. 
And I think you should try a jacket on because then you will understand her and try a coat on too. So I said, I couldn't possibly, you know, it's sacrosanct, these objects. And she said, no, try it on. So first of all, I tried on a coat and it was made of English tweed from Cumbria. It's the softest tweed and it was the colour of autumn leaves and it was one of Gabrielle Chanel's own favourite pieces. It was beautiful, so light. It was like light as a feather. And then there's this jacket, that this was her favourite jacket, and it was a cream tweed jacket and it was trimmed with classic black grosgrain ribbon and with the buttons with the lion's head on them, the lion because of the astrological sign of Leo, and pockets because she always believed there should be a pocket. And I put my hand in the pocket and in the pockets were a pair of gloves and a handkerchief. And I, you know, took them out and I smelt the handkerchief and I could smell distinctly the scent of Chanel. Chanel Exactly. And I thought, am I hallucinating or something? And I said to Gabrielle, is it just me or can I smell it? And she said, yes, you can smell it because she used to spray all her clothes with her favourite scent, Chanel Number 5. And then when she was sleeping at the Ritz, because her bedroom was at the Ritz, she would leave the Ritz and then she would go out of the Rue Combon exit of the Paris Ritz, cross the road, cross Rue Combon. The doorman uh, would ring beforehand and say to the doorman at the Chanel boutique and the Chanel Couture Salon, Mademoiselle is on her way. And so he would get out a big you know bottle of Chanel number five and spray this spiral staircase which of course you've walked up we've both walked up up to the apartment and then she would go into her apartment and it would be filled with the scent of Chanel so in that moment I really felt a kind of profound connection with who she was and Mm. it was so important. I want to talk about another paradox the jewellery because For somebody who had some incredible jewels given to her by the Duke of Westminster, she persuaded everyone to wear fake gems, basically. And she, you know, her influence, I think, in in the narrative of fashion jewels can't really be overstated because she was the first designer, really, who brought a creative integrity to bijou stones. People really only wore the real thing before And it's hard to imagine how radical she was now to make glass and gilt into jewels and flagrantly mix them with real gems. But um, that's what she did, didn't she? Yes, and she does this in the 1920s. And she's sometimes very subversive as a designer. So just as in the First World War, she's using jersey, which is a material that is associated with you know, sort of sporting clothes for men. And she turns it into very chic clothes that are very expensive and takes a very simple material. So too, as you say, she does this with glass and with gilt in the 1920s. But she herself is also mixing these with her own very valuable jewels. I mean, the Duke of Westminster famously gives her extraordinary jewels, including a yard of pearls for every birthday and every Christmas. And many others beside. I mean, when he was wooing her in the early months of 1924, he sends a sort of bouquet from his own hot houses in his country estate in Cheshire in England. And there amidst the sort of orchids and the hothouse flowers and camellias, there's a massive emerald that is hidden. And when they used to argue which they did when he was unfaithful to her or if he'd been flirting with another woman. Legend has it that they were on board the Flying Cloud and he gave her a sort of priceless piece of jewellery to try and win her round again after she'd been flirting with another woman and she just threw it into the waves. Also, um, even before the Duke of Westminster, she was involved with Grand Duke Dmitri, the cousin of the Russian Tsar. And this was at a time when Paris was filled with Russian emigres after the fall of the Romanovs, after the Russian Revolution. And many of them were penniless. Many of them had fled Russia with nothing apart from some jewels that they'd smuggled out. So again, legend has it, he gave her um, some very valuable Romanov pearls. I don't think we'll ever know the truth of that, but that's certainly the story. So she is 
in what she wears, mixing clothes. And of course, her rich clients. She starts dressing, and I did a lot of new research for this book in British archives, including the Royal Archives. People like Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, who marries the Duke of York and becomes the Duchess of York in 1923. As early as 1922, she, like other aristocratic young English women, are wearing Chanel clothes. And they would have had their own tiaras and real Mm -hmm. pearls. But I don't think that her clients were just wearing Chanel paste jewellery. I think they would have mixed them. They were mixing them. Yeah. But then in 1932... After the Wall Street crash, after the Great Depression is taking hold, she, as is so often the case, flips. She, she flips <laughs> and she does her famous diamond mm. exhibition and her famous Which diamond is collection. Weird, given what she says about expensive jewellery, because she does say that um, the mania to want to dazzle disgusts me. Jewellery is not meant to arouse envy, still less astonishment. It should remain an ornament and an amusement. So she's saying that in the 1920s. But for everything that Chanel says once, she's likely to say the complete opposite at another time. By the early 30s, she says that an economic era of such uncertainty, you want to know, you want to have certainty. And the one thing that gives you certainty are diamonds that you can slip into your pocket. So just as the little black dress, just as the aftermath of the First World War, she captures the mood of an epoch. That is what makes Chanel a genius. I mean, Mm. the word genius is overused. There are very few true geniuses in the world of fashion and jewellery. And Chanel, I believe, has the right to be seen as a genius. But she's an artist in her own right. She always said, oh, I'm not an artist, I'm an artisan. But when you look at the way she influences Picasso as much as he influences her, she influences Stravinsky as much as he influences her. The great couturiers, and she was a great couturier as well as a great jeweller, are able to capture a fleeting mood with the kind of delicacy of poetry and turn it into something lasting. And she does it with the design of the Chanel Number no. 5 bottle and indeed the scent itself, the scent of modernity. She does it with the clothes and she does it with those diamond mm. jewels. She was asked by the British Diamond Corporation, wasn't she? As you say, the economic slump, nobody was doing very well. It seems sort of counterintuitive to then do a diamond collection, but that was going to really save an industry, wasn't yes, it? Yes, and in fact, you see on the stock exchange as soon as her jewellery exhibition goes on show, De Beers' stock leaps up and Mm. it does exactly what the diamond merchants, it does exactly what they'd hoped. And this was um, modernism in the way that she had gone back to the convent, hadn't she, for the stars, the comets. and The moon, the crescent moon. The crescent moon, all of that. And she wanted it to be very flexible, pieces that you could take apart and use for different occasions. So it was very modern, wasn't it? Very, very modern. And I think that to be able to express modernism through diamond jewellery is is extraordinary. And the exhibition itself was very modern. It's almost like an art exhibition. It's almost like a sort of surrealist art exhibition installation and she holds it in her home in Paris and there are wax heads that look uncannily lifelike and sort of disembodied hands so there's something rather surreal about it and the jewellery is displayed on these uncannily lifelike heads and hands and Picasso's there Picasso at this point actually has his own bedroom in her home. He's married, and I don't think they had an affair. They just were very, very Are close you friends. Sure about that, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they may, maybe they did. You know, maybe it was one night, but I think they worked together so closely it would have. Who knows? But anyway, he said that she was the only woman in Europe that he could have a sensible conversation with. So he clearly respected, respected her. So at the opening, Picasso's there and Cocteau's there and, you know, everybody in modernism in Paris, as well as high society and 
dukes and duchesses and the British ambassador and so on. And there is this jewellery being displayed. And she's not saying it's art, but it kind of looks like art, the way it's being displayed and the pieces themselves. Which we take for granted now can happen. So many people show them within art installations, but then of course they wouldn't have. Never, that never Mm. would have happened at the time. And of course we have to talk about pearls. Absolutely. The white, how she, having imposed black, she suddenly... Let's do a little flip and let's champion white. And white is very important from the start, I think, because of the nun's habits, as we discussed. So it's black trimmed with white. There's a wonderful picture of her in my book, which comes from the Chanel archives, where she's wearing black, but it's got the white collar and the white cuffs. So I think it's the way white looks, that a cream pearl looks against tanned skin, which she's also popularised, and against black. But you're absolutely right. In the 1930s, she calls it the era of white satin. So after the little black dress of the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age, then comes the Great Depression, the Wall Street crash, and she calls it the era of candid innocence that is somehow symbolised by white. But I think there's also the uncanny element of white, the woman in white, the sort of ghostliness of white that she draws on. And of course, there are white wedding dresses. But when you think about French tradition, queens wear white in mourning and that that goes back to a kind of French medieval tradition. I mean, she probably took her Holy Communion at the convent. Absolutely, wearing a white dress. Mm. Those origin stories Mm. that manifest themselves Mm. and the white communion dress. And of course, she never married. So So she never wore a white Mm. wedding dress, but she did wear a white communion dress. And out of all the fantastical jewels she was given... No ring. Her rings were those Mm. that she had bought herself and made herself. I love the way you describe the pearls in your Riviera style chapter because you sort of capture that moment and how Scott Fitzgerald would have been down there writing about it and tender as the night, the people who he um, was inspired by and put in his novels. And you talk about the pearl because she did make brown fashionable, didn't she? Up until then... Women didn't want to be brown. It showed they'd been outside and working. Yeah, they were literally, you were working class. You were an outdoor labourer if you had a tan. And she makes it very, very fashionable. There's a wonderful line in Fitzgerald's Tender as the Night where he's writing about the heroine, Nicole Diver, and she's wearing her pearls down her back with a swimming costume and the pearls are white against her tanned back. And this is something that the the two women in Scott Fitzgerald's life who inspire this heroine, his wife Zelda, and then another woman, Sarah Murphy, wore their pearls like that. But so too, originally, did Coco Chanel, the white pearls against the tan skin on the Riviera. And she sort of admonishes the girls who take their pearls off to swim. Yes, she thinks how much more wonderful it is to return the pearls to the sea. Chanel is in her own way a pearl, isn't she? When you think how a pearl is formed in an oyster, a pearl is formed because of, in a sense, you know, all those layers and upon layers of irritation that cause that pearl to grow inside an oyster. And from the, you know, these very, I don't want to stretch the metaphor too far, (laughs) but nevertheless, a pearl is born in an oyster. And Chanel is, in a sense, her own pearl. Given her, her great creativity and all the things that she initiated... Where do you think jewellery sits on that pantheon of great changes that she made in the way women dress? I think it's absolutely integral. You can't really sort of separate the jewels. And if you think of embellishment, buttons are a form of jewellery, for example. So the beautiful embellished buttons. Often with camellias. Exactly. Did the camellias, were they inspired by Boy Capel giving her camellias? I think they come from the famous Sarah Burns. Bernhardt performance of The Lady of the Camellias, Mm -hmm. which Chanel goes to see as a teenager. And it was a sensation. It was based Mm -hmm. originally on a Duma novel. And The Lady of the Camellias is a courtesan. And of course, this is very meaningful to Chanel as a kept woman belonging to Etienne Balsan, Mm -hmm. first of all. 
And The Lady of the Camellias becomes a sensation played by Sarah Bernhardt on the Paris stage. She wears white, she gets consumption like Chanel's mother, and she dies coughing up blood. So it's the idea of the coughing of the blood, the drops of red on the beautiful white. And even though she's a courtesan, she's still somehow pure. Yeah. So I think that the Lady of the Camellias is a figure that Chanel perhaps associated with her mother and her mother's death, mm-hmm. dying of consumption, and also responded to that sense of how a courtesan, a demi-mondaine, it still has a kind of inner purity. And the camellia goes all the way back to that. But then, yes, Boy Capel may well have given her camellias, but I had the opportunity to visit the hot houses, the Duke of Westminster's hot houses at Eton Hall, And there is the largest collection of camellias in this country. And they date back, some of them are 100 years old or more, because camellias live a very long time. And even if an individual plant may be coming to the end of its life, it's grafted into a new plant. And I walked into this beautiful greenhouse or hothouse, as they used to be known, and it was filled with white camellias. So the Duke of Westminster was certainly giving her camellias from the time he was wooing her. So you see these camellias occur over and over again as symbols in her life. life. Mm. That's what strikes me, Justine, is that we get used to sort of editors going round to all the big brands and they talk about their codes. But Chanel had codes before any Big brands had coats. And they are her emotions. And they're her emotions. They're yes. the camellias, the wheat, the double C's, the five, the light, everything. And these are brought out time and again now. For instance, the last big fine jewellery collection was tweed. And all the jewellery was replicating precious fabric and her time with the Duke of Westminster in Scotland. But actually, most brands now, you feel they're almost manufacturing codes, whereas these are genuine and go back her early life they go back yes and I think that that emotional resonance is what is so unique to Mm. Chanel in terms of Mm. those jewellery codes the other thing of course is that as people know that jewellery is so intimate we exchange jewellery on such um, profoundly meaningful occasions engagements weddings births deaths you think of mourning jewellery in the victorians for example and we wear it so close to our skins and so i think that because these codes are so expressive of chanel's very important and personal emotions that somehow those emotions inhabit the jewels i mean jewelry you know diamonds they're so hard platinum gold you know these dazzling metals and stones and yet the softness the gentleness it's so touching of the emotions that are contained within these jewels did she have a favorite jewel i think the pearls were incredibly significant Mm. and the reason that in those most famous portraits that we see, you know, by Man Ray, by the most iconic portraits, she's wearing her pearls. And then the Maltese cuffs. Which we haven't talked about because all our listeners, if they look in the catalogue, we've done a special on Verdura Unwrapped. And that, we talked a lot about creating the cuff with Chanel. So people can sort of scroll back and listen to that, yes. Yeah, but she left some of her most important and most loved jewels to Gabrielle Labruni, including rings and bracelets and necklaces. And Gabrielle Labruni told me a couple of stories that stayed with me, that there was a ring that Gabrielle Chanel gave to her before she died, actually, and it was a very valuable ring. And, of course, Chanel had lived through two world wars that were fought on French soil and then the occupation during the Second World War. And so even before her death, she gave her great niece a ring saying, I want you to have that because should there be, you know, a war or catastrophe, you can slip it in your pocket. Wealth that you can take with you. Exactly. So you mentioned the war. So we quickly have to discuss that because this is where she really did begin to tarnish her reputation. Yeah. And the stories that she left behind, because she did get together with another lover who was a Nazi informer. Yes. So I don't know if she falls in love with him. It may well be a pragmatic decision. 
as she did with Etienne Balsan. So André Pallas, her nephew, who may have been her son, had joined the French army at the outbreak of war and with the fall of France in 1940, many, many of those French soldiers are taken prisoner of war, Etienne Balsan among them. Something like over a million French soldiers are taken prisoner of war and they are deported to Germany. And there André is in a prisoner of war camp where he catches TB. And she receives a message saying that he is very seriously sick with TB, which killed her mother. So at this point, and it may not be a coincidence, she begins an affair with Hans Gunther von Dinklager, who is a diplomat based in Paris. He had an English mother and he was very suave. They'd met in London before the First World War. So he was plausible. He gave the impression of being, as it were, a sort of good German in that he spoke English, they'd met in London, he'd had relationships with other Parisiennes, you know, in smart society. And she turns to him and asks him to try and get André out of the prisoner of war camp, which he can't do, but he knows somebody who can. But it still takes 18 months or more to get André out of the camp and return him back to France, where he then recovers from having nearly died, actually. So I think that probably, first of all, it's strategic. Again, survival. Survival. She will always do what is necessary to survive, both to protect herself and to protect the people that she loves. And so she protects André with the means that are at her disposal. So when André returns to France, she is still involved with Dinklage. And what we haven't spoken about yet, but it's very relevant, is that she was very good friends with Winston Churchill, who she'd met in the 1920s through the Duke of Westminster. Churchill was one of his oldest friends. And Chanel and Winston Churchill strike up a close and yet unlikely friendship. And they play guards together. They go fishing together in Scotland. She turns out to be a very good fisherwoman. He comes to see her at the time of the abdication. And even after the outbreak of war, I mean, before the fall of Paris, Churchill continues to visit her at the Ritz. They remain friends. And I was always really intrigued by this relationship because they were properly friends. Anyway, she becomes involved in this scheme with one of Dinklage's superiors, who's called Schellenberg, who is the head of foreign intelligence, and he's based in Berlin. And the scheme is undercover. It certainly doesn't have the approval of Hitler. In fact, if it had been uncovered, Schellenberg, who sets it up, would have been executed. And somebody else in Schellenberg's inner circle, who's called Wilhelm Canaris, was arrested and executed in a concentration camp. But Schellenberg is one of those members of the Third Reich that by this point in the war, kind of from almost 1942 onwards, he thinks that Hitler is mad, they're clearly going to lose the war, and he's trying to get a message to the Allies to say there are these people within the German high command that are trying to get rid of Hitler. So Canaris, his close associate, is involved in one of the many assassination plots on Hitler. Hitler. So I think to call Chanel a Nazi because of this, I'm not here to whitewash Chanel, but I think it's unfair. She is involved in renegade members of the Third Reich who are trying to get a message to Churchill through Chanel, who is one of Churchill's friends. But now this is where the new material is. <laughs> she said but before I said but. <laughs> what is remarkable, so yes, of course she shouldn't have been in a relationship with a German in occupied Paris. But let's remember this. My last book, Miss Dior, is about the story of Catherine Dior, Christiane Dior's sister, who was an active member of the French Resistance, joins the French Resistance when there are only 100,000 active members of the French Resistance. Even at the height of the French Resistance, which is in the run-up to the liberation of Paris in 1944, there are maximum 400,000 because it is dangerous, it is terrifying, you are risking everything. I had always wondered whether Chanel really had any resistance links and we're going to go back to where we started 
Carol okay. together at La Pausa. <laughs> because before we were together at La Pausa... We were dancing, by the way, everybody. We were dancing, <laughs> Carol and I, at La Pausa. And that's not the only place we've danced together. No, we've danced in Venice. We've danced, <laughs> we've danced with Cartier in France. <laughs> yeah, we have danced many times. But when I went to La Pausa for the first time, I met somebody who'd been the housekeeper there and her mother had previously been the housekeeper and during the Second World War, she had been a little girl and she had told me that the cellars of La Pausa were used by the French resistance for a hidden wireless transmitter and it was also the cellars were used to hide Jewish refugees and as a staging post because as you know La Pausa is in Rockbrun which is very close to the border. So the story was, and Robert Streitz the architect of La Pausa was certainly in the French resistance and so too was another of Chanel's lovers who we haven't had time to talk about, Pierre Reverdy, was a very key member of the resistance and we know, or I rather now know, that Chanel had helped both Reverdy and Robert Streitz who were both in the resistance. Then, so the archives of the French resistance which list the people that were actually official active members of the resistance are not digitized. They were just in kind of cardboard boxes and cartons in the archives of the French military archives, the national archives of defense. And nothing has been digitized. But I went through various boxes while I was researching about Catherine Dior. But then very recently this year, a few of the documents, or I mean, some, they've got to a certain year, and they are digitizing them. And lo and behold, who is listed as a member of a particular resistance network that is linked to providing intelligence to the Allies, but Gabrielle Chanel. So my hunch is proved to be right. The resistance was not just one network. It was very fragmentary. There were many different underground networks. And we think of the resistance as being one formal network. It's not. But the network that Chanel is listed as being part of Mm -hmm. provides direct intelligence to British intelligence in London. And I'd always suspected this might be the case because when Schellenberg is debriefed by the Allies after the end of the war in 1945, he's flown to London and he's debriefed by two members of the SIS, Special Intelligence Service, and MI6, both of whom happened to be uncles of my husband. And I got the debriefing notes, took ages to get them through the archives and for them to be declassified. But anyway, as you said at the beginning, I've been doing this for 25 years. And Schellenberg is clearly taken seriously as somebody who was attempting to provide intelligence to the British. She was also, by this point, helping the Swedish get people out of Ravensbrück concentration camp, which is where Catherine Dior was. So, yes, he was in the Third Reich, but by this point, and maybe it was for pragmatism, but he switched sides. Anyway, it is clear that Chanel was a member of the resistance providing intelligence by the beginning of 1943. So that is totally new. You heard it here first. Well, Justine, we are just in awe of the research and the levels of detail that you've had to go through to get this new research. And We want to sympathise, but we also have to look at the fact that she did present herself in some ways anti-Semitic. And that's very difficult. And it, Plus, it, she closed her business during the war. And we will find out in a few weeks' time, we're going to talk about Suzanne Belperon in detail, who purely kept the business open to provide employment and livelihood for the people around her. But as always, there are two sides to okay. this. So Chanel says she closes the business because this is not a time to do business during the war. Now, there are people that kept their businesses open. Cartier. Exactly. And there are also couturiers who keep their businesses open. Jacques Fath, Marcel Rocha, practically everybody. They are inevitably then collaborating to a degree with the Germans because they are selling to the Germans' wives and mistresses and to black marketeers. Catherine Dior is tortured by members of the French Gestapo who are also black marketeers. And the black market is very linked during the occupation with people who are buying jewellery. So even if you're not 
the wife or girlfriend of a Nazi. You could be a French black marketeer or a French industrialist who's doing business with the Germans and making money. So it's very complicated. And as you point out in the book, everyone's informing on everyone. Yes, and it's also... I don't think I could have understood this period without doing all the research I did Mm. into my book, Miss Dior, that what happens during the occupation... You know, where does collaboration end? Where does resistance begin? Now, we have not been occupied in this country. We are very, very fortunate in the UK and in America. But if you look at what's happening in Ukraine or in Russia, I mean, to be a dissident, you know, to be a resistant in those countries, whether it's Russia or occupied Ukraine or, you know, wherever people are living under a repressive regime takes enormous courage. Now, we've moved away from the anti-Semitism and let's get back to that because it's important. And it's something I feel strongly about because my father was of Jewish heritage and I had relatives who died in the Holocaust. But for every anti-Semitic statement that you can attribute to Chanel, so too can you find one where she's talking about how much, you know, she loves her Jewish friends. Who were rich and buying from her. And her doctor. (laughs) But Marie-Hélène, you know, de Rothschild is one of her closest friends. She is so paradoxical. Mm. The other thing that is key is that the Wertheimers, who still own Chanel today, are Jewish. They went into business with Chanel in 1921 with the launch of Chanel No. 5. They keep the perfume company going during the Second World War. But she tried to oust them. She tries to oust them. The anti-Semitic... The Jewish laws of the German exactly. occupation, which is a kind of really dirty... It's a deed. terrible thing to do. And there's no getting away from the fact that she tries to use those laws. She fails, by the way because the Wertheimers have put the company in the hands of one of their trusted friends, Felix Amio, who's Aryan, and he returns it to them after the war. But who is her most long-standing partner, Hmm. who's almost like a husband, Pierre Wertheimer? So after the war, they make their peace. He backs her again with her comeback collection. Pierre Wertheimer ends up, you know, buying the whole of the company, And Gabrielle Palace, her great niece, who may have been her granddaughter, said to me, she loved Pierre Wertheimer. He was like the good husband she never had. He's Jewish. It's so complicated. Very complex. What I learned, you know, yes, there is black and white. There is good and evil. But when it comes to trying to pin Chanel down, there are so many shades of grey. And in the thousands and thousands and thousands of documents that I went through relating to the Second World War, relating to the resistance, relating to the Germans, relating to the occupation, those documents prove the many, many, many shades of grey. So all I would urge people, well, obviously I hope people will read my book, (laughs) but I would also urge people to not to fall into those easy knee-jerk reactions. I also think there's a lot of misogyny about Chanel. Chanel does exemplify the female gaze in a way that very few women do in the world of couture and indeed in the world of modernism, in art. Women are far more likely to be muses, but Chanel holds her own in terms of artistic creation. She is a contemporary of Picasso's, of Cocteau's, of Stravinsky. They do respect her. And she's earning more money. Well, not more money than Picasso. Not than Picasso. (laughs) Picasso earns far more money than she does. She's keeping Stravinsky, isn't she? She does keep Stravinsky. He would have literally been homeless without her and so too would Cocteau. And she's endlessly paying for Cocteau to go through rehab because of his opium addiction. So when people are punished for what happened during the occupation, for being anti-Semitic, for collaborating, do we ever hear about the men who collaborated in the world of couture and jewellery? No. Chanel becomes the convenient scapegoat. Now that is not to let her off the hook. That is not to whitewash her. But when you think how few people actively resisted, she was one of the people that is listed Mm -hmm as those 400,000 people who resisted. And you still see it now. Oh, Chanel is a Nazi. That, I would respectfully suggest, is unfair, Mm. given how many other people were 
involved in pretty shady activities, including the most famous names yes. in couture and jewellery. You're obviously quite clearly a bit obsessed by her. Yes. Obviously. Um, that goes without saying. Do you like her? I feel I would, she, if I could meet anybody, you know. That would be the person. I would want to meet her. I often think, you know, what would she make of me? spending all this time but I hope that a stalker yes exactly <laughs> but I also feel that she's sort of in terms of magical thinking she has opened doors for me I mean the fact that I ended up going through the fishing records and the Duke of Westminster's Scottish estate was really you know she opened the door to me and I on many occasions sort of there were strange coincidences and moments when the universe chimed when I felt like a kind of a mm-hmm. locked door opened and so I like to think that she was making it easier mm. for me to find things out but what I admire her for is to overcome disaster heartbreak bereavement you know was she a nice person no I'm sure she wasn't would she have liked me I don't know, probably not. Would I have wanted to spend time with her? Absolutely. Do I admire her courage? Absolutely. Did she make profoundly terrible decisions at times in her life? Yes, absolutely. Was she a genius? Yes, absolutely. Is she a symbol, an all too rare symbol of the female gaze? Yes, yes, and yes again. Could she still surprise you? Are there things you have yet to uncover? Yes, I mean, the surprise of finding her name in the archives Mm. of the French resistance. I mean, I felt like it leapt out, you know, of these dusty archives. And I was like, oh my God. So yes, of course, she could surprise me again. I felt that when you put your hand in the pocket of that jacket and pulled out her handkerchief, there must be some DNA. I think we need to know if she had a child. I think that's the next book. Yes, if only. (laughs) Well, let's hope, Carol, that you and I will be brought together to dance somewhere again together in one of these places, these Mm. magical, mythical landscapes that also exist in real life and make you dream that make you dream and are part of Mm. the landscape of Gabrielle Chanel so here's to our next dance our next dance and I think the ultimate paradox really is that she said fashion should express the place the moment and yet it's expressed it for generations after well as she also said mode passes style endures Justine thank you so much for coming and sharing that knowledge i feel like we could have talked about her for another quite few hours well maybe we'll but do we... a part two when i know more <laughs> <Part> de... <laughs> yes exactly when we we've uncovered the uh, her love child um so or her the, missing jewels the missing jewels that's the thing that we've got to do when carol and i go on search to track down the missing jewels yes, that's it thank you justine thank you carol Thank you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of If Jules Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwalton.com slash podcasts. If you've enjoyed it, please share it any way you can and do leave us a comment and a rating. And for more information about our sponsors, it's foolygemstones.com. Please join me again in two weeks for the next Jeweled Nugget. You may have noticed there's been the Venice Film Festival and Telluride, the film festival season is beginning, but it's slightly less sparkly because obviously the stars aren't coming out in all their finery because of the strike. So we thought it's a really good moment to talk to the go-to jeweler for Hollywood, Martin Katz in Beverly Hills, about actresses, jewelry, red carpets, and jewellery dressing and he has the best Elizabeth Taylor story you've ever heard so please join me then in two weeks and thanks for listening bye bye If Jewels Could Talk with Carol Woolton is produced by Natasha Cowan music and editing by Tim Thornton graphics by Scott Bentley illustration by Geordie Lavanda you can find our sponsors at foolygemstones.com and me at carolwoolton.com